Hey guys, and welcome to another edition of The Kevin Moore Show. Now, on today's show, I'm about to be joined by the legendary John Lear. Now, I did this interview in person with John, and just to give you a very short background on John, he's spent over 43 years as a commercial pilot and holds the most FAA Airman certificates ever issued to a single pilot. Now, John retired in 2001 with over 19,000 hours, having flown almost everywhere in the world except China, Russia, and Antarctica. He flew over 555 combat missions for the CIA in Southeast Asia and holds over 17 world speed records in the Learjet, set on May 26, 1966. Now, John is scored in aircraft design, construction, and accident investigation. He has four daughters and lives with his wife, a former actress with Warner Bros. in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, in 2008, John was disabled and now spends most of his time researching the mysteries of our moon, universe, and posting about his career on Facebook as a whistleblower. So, enjoy my interview with John. Well, John Lear, thank you so, so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's uh, great to be here in Vegas and in your home as well. There's um, so much memories on the walls. There's, there's so much information in all these pictures. Um, and, and I guess this is just, you know, built up over the years. And you're, are you always adding to it as well? Always adding to it. Yeah. Uh, the, the newest one, the newest thing I put up there is the poster that I showed you of the... Uh, Pictures that uh, uh, Bruce Swartz has taken of the moon. What's he found on there? Okay, Bruce Swartz, <clears throat> about a year ago, heard me say that uh, people lived on the moon. Uh, it so intrigued him that he wanted to find out for himself. So he bought a 12 inch telescope <clears throat> and started looking around and thought, you know, he'd found enough evidence there that there was something up there so he went and bought a 14 inch telescope and he found out by accident that there's a hologram that covers the moon and it hides all the industrial areas on the moon um, and there's huge huge areas um, thousands of buildings bridges um, highways and he started uh, videotaping those. And uh, of course, my interest started out many years ago when a friend called from Chicago and said that uh, he'd heard I was interested in the moon and he wanted to show me something. So on one of my trips to the American Trans Air, I ended up in Chicago overnight, called him, went over to his house, <clears throat> and he had a Canadian uh, book called Exploring uh, Space with Binoculars. And in the back of this book, there was five pictures, <clears throat> a very high resolution coming from lunar orbiter. And there's one of the interior north face of Copernicus. Uh, actually, two photographs, one from directly overhead and one from Oblique. And <clears throat> he showed me uh, the overhead one uh, where there was five cylinders about 200 feet high, uh, maybe 50 feet in diameter. They were huge, <clears throat> unmistakably man-made. And when I say man, you know, alien-made, whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so this really intrigued me that there's something on the moon definitely man-made. A few weeks later, I was looking at the oblique photograph of Copernicus, and I came across, and I was on standby for a flight, and I remember just laying there in bed looking at this photo, and I saw three um, vapor uh, uh, jets coming up. And this meant that there was had to be an atmosphere on the moon because you can't have vapor, uh, visible vapor, without an atmosphere. <clears throat> and I had originally 
uh, come to the conclusion that there was atmosphere on the moon uh, because there's a, you know, there's only about eight photographs of the of the moon. Uh, they keep them very tightly under control, <clears throat> and there was a photo taken in 1946 by the Lick Observatory, and uh, to the north west of Endymion, towards the north part of the moon, there was a huge explosion. It not only spread out for miles, but it went up and expanded and then stopped at the atmosphere and spread out. And that's when I really started, there must be an atmosphere on the moon. And uh, incidentally, along that um, area, about two months ago, uh, Yerkes Observatory, one of the uh, most um, uh, recognized and uh, and uh, really good observatories, and one of the earliest observatories, uh, on their website, they had a picture of the moon uh, uh, that they called Supermoon. And they dated it, and the date was something like April 10th, 2009. I looked at the photo, and because of I'm so uh, familiar with all the photos, I recognize that photo <laughs> as the Lake Observatory photo taken in 1946. And uh, I put a post uh, on my Facebook page. And within about eight hours, Yerkes took their entire website down, took all the photos of the moon off, and filled it with interior photos of the observatory. And what I had done is caught them red-handed, uh, faking moon photos. Uh, the same thing happened with National Geographic about a month later. They were using that same uh, Lick Observatory 1946 photo, and I don't know why, but anyway, they were trying to fool us, and they didn't get away with it. But when I found the uh, vapor coming up, I called Richard Hoagland. I told him what I saw, and he said, well, email me a, a uh, drawing of what you think you see. And so I FedExed him a drawing, never heard from him. But uh, I started continuing my research, and everything I saw pointed towards somebody's up there. Now, I read the uh, original books by... Um, I forget who it was, that somebody else that's on the moon and seen all those pictures, but they really weren't that clear. It's obviously something, but not that clear. <clears throat> and then I came across uh, um, some photos and Ron Schmidt, who is my partner in thelivingmoon.com on the web and done fantastic work over the past 10 or 15 years, he and I decided to get somebody to take a photo of the moon for just us. And we found a guy in uh, the UK, I forget what his name is, he had a 10 inch telescope, <clears throat> and he took 192 separate photos of the moon and put them together digitally and gave us a kick-ass photo of the moon. And the greatest part was the crater Aristarchus, which is, if you're looking at the moon, it's 10 o'clock uh, towards the edge uh, and several hundred miles uh, northwest of Copernicus. And what we saw, and I'll show you the picture here, is an obvious um, construction of something. Uh, it's hexagonal, hexagonal in shape and it has six support huge beams uh, and it glows bright uh, blue. At this time that we put that together, uh, Ron and I went to a UFO conference in San Jose. <clears throat> San Jose is near Lawrence Livermore, which is one of the very secret research, uh, uh, research uh, places uh, along with Los Alamos National Laboratories. And uh, Lawrence Livermore is where Dr. Teller hangs out. <clears throat> One of their uh, scientists came to this UFO conference 
and he was looking at our picture of Aristarchus, and he said, do you know what that blue is? And we said, no. He says, that's the Charonk effect. What that is, is radiation coming in contact with air. He said, when radiation comes in contact with air, it turns blue. <laughs> so he gave us the lead on, on what we were looking at. And, you know, ever since then, we've thought that Aristarchus is a 23 mile in diameter generator, maybe generating all the power needed on the moon. Now the moon was uh, constructed on Jupiter about 40 million years ago and has been towed around to the different planets in our solar system. Now NASA tells us there's nine planets in our solar system. In fact, there's 40 planets. And each of these planets has several moons. And each of these planets along with several moons has several different civilizations. So there is so much going on in this solar system. When they talk about searching for life in space, <laughs> it's all you know, it's right in our solar system. There's so many people around here. Yes, humans and and what we call ETs. Actually, we're ETs because none of us are from Earth. <clears throat> but uh, uh, we took that information and uh, started getting. Uh, more interesting pictures of the moon. One is Endymion, which is to the north and uh, east of Plato. And there's an obvious, uh, like, radio telescope uh, array on the south southeast corner of Endymion. <clears throat> and in a couple of the NASA photographs, it's airbrushed out. But on a couple, you can, and particularly on the photo we got, uh, clearly, something is there. And that photo is on the wall just over there? Yes. Okay, well I'll remember to... Yeah, I'll job. show you Aristarchus, yeah. Endymion, and then the other thing we saw, which I'll show you, is on the Sinus uh, Mari, uh, Mari Chrysiam, which is a huge uh, sea uh, on the far uh, northeast part of the moon, perfectly round, and it has lots of different uh, constructs around the side. And to the north, on the north shore, there is what is obviously some kind of antenna about three to four miles high, shaped exactly like a champagne glass. You just look at it and say, yeah, that, that's a champagne glass. Well, obviously it's not a champagne glass, but it, it's an antenna shaped like a thing. Uh, the other area that uh, interested us uh, was Damoiseau. Damoiseau is a crater uh, several miles, uh, several hundred miles to the east of Grimaldi on the far eastern or far western side of the moon. Uh, and the photos uh, that Lunar Orbiter took and other photos show a city uh, as big as Los Angeles. Uh, but with obvious buildings and roads, and we joke to say there's obviously a, um, a McDonald's Golden Arches there. Uh, it's so obvious that there is a city there. <clears throat> and we've used that to photo, and there's one in the hallway there that you'll be able to take and see um, how obvious it looks. Uh, there's several others. Uh, one of the things uh, that we did when the UFO conference came up is there's a guy named Norman Bergren who is, uh, was for his entire career, 45 years, uh, a scientist with many different corporations, Lockheed, Douglas, uh, all those corporations. He had the highest of clearances. <clears throat> when he retired in 1986, uh, he was interested in the rings of Saturn, and he asked NASA for their best Voyager photographs. And he took these photographs, uh, enlarged them, and found three spaceships in, uh, not spaceships, but obvious construction uh, uh, ships uh, in the rings of Saturn. And the biggest one was 2,400 miles in length and 1,200 miles in diameter. We're talking a fairly large spaceship. 
and he felt those patients were involved uh, in making the rings, and he wrote a book called uh, Ring Makers of Saturn by Norman Bergring, uh, which in those days cost 35 bucks. It's on the website now for $3,500 a piece. So fortunately, I have two copies, one's <coughs> autographed by Norman. Anyway, on our way to uh, uh, San Jose, uh, I stopped to see and chat with Norman. Uh, very nice guy. We formed a friendship that we've had uh, for until he passed away a couple years ago. And I used to drop by all the time and talk to him. Uh, one of the times I talked to him uh, was after 9-11. And I mentioned the fact that I thought that the airplanes that crashed into the building were holograms. He said, John, I think you're right, and I'll tell you why. He says, one day I was on my way to work. <clears throat> he lives in Los Altos Hills, which is between San Francisco and Sunnyvale. Going down the freeway to Sunnyvale, early in the morning, like uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, he said, I looked up to my right, and here, 200 feet above the freeway, is a Boeing 747 just going along about the same speed as my car, and I looked up, and it was obviously an airplane. It just, you know, it couldn't have been uh, some kind of uh, weird uh, projection. It, it looked like an airplane flying along, and he said, I watched it for about 30 seconds, and then it just disappeared like that. So he said, that was my introduction to holograms, and that's where I think our technology and holograms has advanced to where we can project uh, 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 project uh, objects that look like the real thing. And that's why I think that uh, you're correct that the Boeing 767 United Airlines that did uh, the South Tower uh, was a hologram. Uh, and then, of course, we have the CNN photos that have the uh, airplane going into the building like it was butter. When in fact, if an airplane that big uh, hit the building, it would come instantly apart. An airplane is made in three sections, the forward cockpit section, the center section, and the tail section. If an uh, airplane had hit the building, which is made of concrete and steel, it would have immediately knocked the tail section off and it would have gone up against the building and crashed down to the sidewalk. <clears throat> but in fact, there was no debris of any kind on the sidewalk below the South Tower. So uh, all this points to just a hologram uh, hitting the uh, hitting uh, buildings one and two. <clears throat> the reason uh, this, the 9-11, uh, uh, was so successful and we haven't been able to uncover uh, any of the perps since then is because they used uh, two very advanced uh, technologies uh, that the public knows nothing about and it served the purpose of uh, convincing the public that it was just Muslims in airplanes crashing in. <clears throat> the hologram was one and direct energy weapons is the other. Now, fortunately, uh, Judy Woods wrote a book called um, Where Did the Towers Go? And it's a fantastic book, 600 pages, uh, four color, hundreds of photographs. Uh, and her, <coughs> uh, her hypothesis is, is that that was direct energy weapons. She doesn't believe, necessarily believe, that they came from space. But from contacts I have, <clears throat> I believe there's 13 orbiting direct energy weapons that's used for number one, destruction of the Mira building in Oklahoma City, number two, the World Trade Center one and two and seven, and the Northern and Southern California fires, uh, which we believe were started uh, in accordance with the uh, uh, Agenda 21 and what, what they want to clear out that area. Uh, so, uh, but the public doesn't believe that. They don't believe, number one, that there's direct energy weapons uh, or that holograms 
that those airplanes were holograms. They just cannot believe it. Well, the people that were in those planes, what happened to the people that had boarded those planes and obviously the loved ones right now who would say that their loved ones were on that plane and they've lost them? We don't know what happened to the people that were in the airplanes. In fact, if there were any people. Now, uh, just in the case of uh, Malaysian MS-370 and MS-17, MS-17 never existed. It was an uh, airplane uh, that they faked the uh, uh, flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur so that they could intercept that route with MS-370. Uh, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But they hire crisis actors uh, that pretend that they have loved ones and they stand around and cry about, you know. But what if those loved ones could be traced back? What if the people, the, what if I could go to Malaysia now and find family members who have always been at that house, have got all the photographs of their loved ones, and will turn with the story of the people that, um, that from the mum's and dad's perspective as well, you know, they, they yeah. had that daughter, they had that son. Yeah. I don't have an answer for that, but I can tell you that uh, MS-370 was specific, the disappearance was specifically to take over the patent that was owned by the five Chinese engineers on MS-70 and Jacob Rothschild. Um, the airplane refueled in Diego, Sar Diego Garcia was flown to Tel Aviv. The passengers were probably, uh, they probably raised the cabin altitude uh, until they were all dead. Uh, they landed in Tel Aviv and they had the uh, uh, Boeing interruptible autopilot in that Boeing 777 as they have had in the 757, 767 and all airplanes Boeing has produced since 1985. Now the interruptible autopilot is uh, strictly uh, a uh, <clears throat> piece of electronic equipment that uh, can be controlled from the ground. They can take over the airplane in case it's hijacked, take control away from the pilot, and take that uh, airplane and fly it anywhere they want and land it anywhere they want. Uh, the advantage here in MS-370 is the Israelis got it to Tel Aviv and uh, added to the interruptible autopilot a uh, control that they could control the airplane from a fighter alongside the MS-370. So what they did three weeks after MS-370 disappeared, um, what they were trying to do was eliminate these five engineers, which were already dead from cabin pressure station, took off the airplane from <coughs> Tel Aviv, flew it north to intercept exactly the time and route of the fictional MS-17, flew it on uh, MS-17's route until they got to Ukraine, turned slightly left, flew into the Zionist controlled area uh, of Ukraine, and then the fighters shot down MS-70, MS-370, which was pretending to be MS-17. The first doctors to the crash site said, these people have been dead for three weeks. These people weren't killed in this crash. Uh, several months later, almost a year later, Jacob Rothschilds gets killed in a helicopter that my friend Mike Green was flying, uh, hit by a Cessna 150. Uh, we think this is the right Dragon Society to do that, but we can't prove that. But what happened is with the five engineers and Jacob Rothschild out of the picture, the entire control of this secret patent went to the Carlisle Group. Uh, and that's where they wanted it in the first place. And that was what the whole MS-760, MS-370 was about. And what was this secret patent? What, who were these five engineers? Uh, pardon? Who, what was this secret that the five engineers were keeping? Was it a we secret patent? We don't know what the patent was. Right. Um, at least I don't know for sure. Uh, there's people that think it had to do with the inner inoperable autopilot, Boeing inoperable autopilot. They think it has something to do with that. Uh, I don't, I think it's something else. But whatever it was, the Carlisle Group owns it lock, stock, and barrel now. <clears throat> so back to... Uh, and where did that research come from? Where did, what, what, what people have you spoken to to get that information? 
That would be um, Stone, S-T-O-N-E, I forget his first name, but he's the one that did the original research on that and had the photos at the crash site in the Zionist controlled portion of Ukraine that absolutely positively identified that airplane as 370, not MS-17. Okay, so that's based on his research as well, Ryan. Okay, right. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and just going back to, um, uh, well, let's go back to 9-11 as well, because there was, there was so much you touched upon there. I, I've always found it difficult to, to think that there are directed energy weapons in that, um, in, in that terrorist attack. And, you know, most Americans that were in New York on that day will probably say, well, they, they never witnessed, you know, in, with their eyes, they never saw any directed energy weapon. It was just that, you know, the, the buildings came down yeah. and, you know, there, was, there, there wasn't like a, a red They're ray or green ray. They're saying it was ray. a nuke in the basement. But if there was a nuke in the basement, it wouldn't have disintegrated from the top down. It would have disintegrated from the bottom up. Right, right. But w with a directed energy weapon of that scale to take down the, the Twin Towers, surely would you, would you have not have seen an, uh, something hitting it, or would it have been invisible to the human eye? Yeah, you can't see a beam like that. Now, uh, the direct energy weapons have been photographed by uh, John Walson. I have pictures on my hallway that you can take pictures of them. I think there's 13 of them. Uh, you can look up John Walson. Uh, secret uh, space weapons and uh, see those direct energy weapons yourself. Now the way that they came about was the uh, it starts back at the end of World War II when Germany knew they were going to lose. Germany was trying to build their atomic bomb, their own atomic bomb. The U.S. was trying to build their atomic bomb. Now the difference between the two uh, efforts was the U.S. could build uh, the trigger and uh, the uh, insides of it. The only thing they couldn't produce was the plutonium needed for the explosion. Germany couldn't build the trigger or anything else. They could only produce the plutonium. So it's a, just a couple of weeks before, or actually a couple of months before, the end of the war, Germany knew they were going to lose. They came over to the United States and they said, look, we know you're trying to build a bomb. We'll give you the plutonium you need to finish your bomb and bomb Japan. And all we ask is that at the end of the war, a couple of years later, you let 5,000 of our Nazi SS troops in, or not soldiers in. Give them American citizenship, no questions asked. We agreed to that, and that became Operation Paperclip, run by John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State, Alan Dulles, his brother, who was head of the CIA, and Eleanor Dulles, their sister, who was head of the Berlin desk. <clears throat> as soon as they got, as soon as the 5,000 Nazis got in, they took, started taking over all the companies. First is they took over NACA, NACA, made it NASA, National Air and Space Administration, <clears throat> and for you know, it's always been controlled by uh, the SS um, people, except for the administrator. He's always been American, but he doesn't know what's going on in the inside. So, what happened in 1961 when President Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade? Uh, they knew for a fact that they couldn't do that. But they thought, what a great way to make money. We'll fake Mercury, we'll fake Gemini, we'll fake Apollo, and we'll get $40 billion to spend the way we want, which is what they did. And that's how the U.S. Navy space program started. So when President Trump, a couple of months ago, said he's going to have a space program, you know, there's already a space program, and it's been op in operation for 40 years. And they've got orbiting factories. They've got orbiting direct energy weapons. There's a f between 1,000 and 1,500 astronauts who are current and, current and qualified who are in space right now. <clears throat> and the public is told, uh, with the end of the shuttle program, we have to beg the Russians to get a ride to the International Space Station. Pure P.S. We launched three rockets a week out of 
Kwajalein, which is where the base is for the uh, U.S. Navy space program. Uh, Kwajalein is in the South Pacific, and uh, it's, a, it's a chain of islands, uh, and they launch rockets three times a week. There's a, a huge runway there uh, called the Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile uh, Test uh, Area, and uh, I had a chance to fly there once with a cargo airline. <clears throat> I didn't see anything, but I could say I was there. The other place I went that I never thought I'd get to go to is Johnston Island. Now, Johnston Island is between Hawaii and Wake Island. has always been super secret. You're not allowed to go anywhere near there. You're not allowed to talk to them. It's always been very, very, very secret. <clears throat> and we think it has to do with uh, the destruction of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, weapons used for uh, toxic gas. Anyway, in uh, <clears throat> the nine, middle 90s, uh, the C-141 uh, the Air Force C-141 was grounded. The C-41 is what used to run uh, the Coral Sea runs. The Coral Sea runs was supplying food and equipment to Midway Island, Johnson Island, uh, and then come back. Since the C-141 was grounded, they had nothing to do that, so they hired the company that I worked for, and I flew a DC-8, uh, to do the Coral Run. And of course, now I'd been to Midway many times, and uh, when I was flying for the CIA and delivering airplanes to uh, Vietnam, uh, but I never had a chance to go to Johnson, and this gave me a chance to go. And uh, on final at Johnson, I took a couple of pictures. <clears throat> we landed and I taxied up to operations, and as we came to a halt, uh, six by six with a mounted M60 pulled up in front of our airplane and he had a machine gun and he pointed towards the cockpit. So the sergeant comes running up the stairs and he says, welcome to Johnson Island. Uh, you guys are uh, free to uh, fi uh, file your flight plan over there and uh, we'll have you out of here uh, in two hours. The only thing you don't want to do is go behind this airplane or look behind this airplane or that guy will shoot you. <laughs> so. Uh, we got a couple of pictures, <clears throat> and it was nice to go there. We didn't see much. I've kept a look, uh, kept a watch on Johnson Island, uh, and supposedly it's going completely dismantled. Uh, but I believe that both Wake Island and Johnson are being used for uh, launches for the secret space program. Now, uh, recently, <clears throat> the U.S. is... Uh, rolled out the um, Block II Virginia class submarines, highly advanced, and they've showed the, uh, the public the USS Colorado, which was Block II, and they've said that it has very advanced uh, technology, but they didn't bother to uh, tell the public what the technology was. But I'll tell you what the technology was. There's three parts to it. Number one, is the hull plate, which is normally steel, is a plate called D.D. D. D, D is manufactured in one of the factories in space run by the U.S. space program. Uh, it has to be made in zero gravity. <clears throat> and the, um, uh, the components of it are that it's lighter than titanium and stronger than steel, and with a small electrical charge, can keep the um, ocean between five and, seven, five and seven centimeters away from the hull. What this does is eliminates the drag of a boat, an aircraft carrier, or a submarine, and uh, we're no longer limited by the uh, the formula uh, of a hull-based uh, craft in water, which is 1.34 times the square root of the water line, which uh, essentially limits all craft to about 45 knots. Whereas with this D.D .D now used uh, as a hull material uh, with no drag, the 
the aircraft carriers, such as the Gerald Ford, which has just been launched, which is the largest aircraft carrier, could go 100 knots, even faster. Uh, and the same thing with the submarine. Uh, it, uh, it can go 100 knots. So this is one of the things they use. The other thing they used is fission reactors. Now, we've used fusion reactors um, for, um, for years, and we're told that uh, fission won't, um, and I may have those mixed up, but uh, whichever one it is, they've told us that uh, that technology won't be available for another decade or so, when in fact, we've been using it for about 10 years. And uh, these reactors uh, now in the uh, uh, in the submarines and aircraft carriers, they're not only lighter, but they they give more power. So um, I may have mixed that up when I say we're probably using fission uh, and fusion is what we've developed. Uh, the other uh, technology we've used is instead of propellers on uh, submarines. We're using what they call uh, jet pump propulsion. And it's propulsion they use in the submarine uh, that's more efficient and it's much quieter. Uh, there's a picture, uh, if you go to the web and uh, type in USS Colorado, there's pictures of the construction of Colorado that shows the jet pump propulsion on the back of these new Block II submarines. So those are the three things they use on the uh, uh, on the new Block II Virginia gas submarines. Wow, that's uh, an incredible amount of information there as well, John. Um, thank you for sharing that, by the way. Um, so, just going back as well to even the moon, when we first started speaking about the moon and the, the holographic technology. So, whose technology is that? Well, uh, the people live on the moon. There's uh, my estimate used to be 500 million, but in fact, based on Bruce Schwartz's new videos, I believe the human population on the moon is 2 billion. Now, none of those humans are from Earth. They're from somewhere else. I don't know where else. But uh, those 2 billion people live up there uh, and they uh, trade uh, with the other 39 planets in our solar system and they have technici techno uh, technology far in advance to what we've But had. then what side of the moon is that on? Because if you was an astronomer or an amateur astronomer, astronomer uh, you would probably not see that with the telescope because you're saying that there is a hologram, hologram up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you're saying that, that, that we've got pictures over there that show the hologram switched off or? No, so they're able to penetrate it. And yeah. he does it somehow with light, and I'm not sure how he does it. Right. But those pictures on the wall there, you can take a look at the top of that poster and see uh, some photos of, of these massive industrialized areas up there. And of course, when the astronauts from the Apollo missions have come back and there's, you know, they've reported what they've reported, which is obviously it's, it's quite barren, uh, you would say that, that that's a cover-up? No. No astronaut ever went to the moon. No astronaut ever went more than 500 miles, 400 miles into space. And the reason was is because there's a Van Allen belt, which is highly radioactive, that extends from 500 miles to 25,000 miles out in space. The reason E.T. put that Van Allen belt is there, so we couldn't visit any place because they don't want us contaminating the solar system or the moon or anything else until we complete our essential job here on Earth, which is to live with integrity, without envy, hate, or greed, and to express our love to our family. So they don't want us out there, and that's why they put the Van Allen Belt. Not even if you could uh, go through that Van Allen Belt very quickly. I mean, just it's no. a very brief... You would need five feet of lead to defeat the purpose of the radioactivity. And that's why they put it there, so that we could not get beyond. So all of the, uh, the stories you hear about the moon are fake. Stanley Kubrick, who 
made the year 2001 as one of the greatest uh, producers of uh, science fiction films. Uh, um, he was asked by President Nixon in 1968, uh, asked, taken to the White House, said, we've got a problem, we can't get to the moon, but we have to have the public think we did. So we want you to make the films uh, of the astronauts on the moon. He agreed to do that. <clears throat> the films were made in London, or somewhere in the UK. And uh, when he was done, he went home and uh, stayed most of his life in his house because he knew that, uh, or had heard that every single person that was part of the moon secret was killed. And he didn't want to die until it was his time. Now, he made two, photo, two films after that, Eyes Wide Shut and The Shining. And both of those films have uh, secret uh, things in them that, sh that, that he's trying to tell the public, hey, we didn't go. And uh, there's all kinds of little, new, uh, the number of the door, uh, the kids wearing a, uh, a rocket, Saturn V t-shirt, just all kinds of little things like that throughout both Eyes Wide Shut and The Shining. But obviously, I mean, I can't do this. If I could get access to uh, Buzz Aldrin, which um, I'd have to be part of the mainstream media to do that probably, right? But if I could, and, uh, you know, he, he would say that, no, he, you know, he went to the moon. He was there. I mean, that's his story. Yes. Uh, they have advanced mind control to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, part where it's absolutely perfect. For instance, in 1989, when Bob and I got caught up at the test site, the next day his boss, Dennis Mariana, uh, took him uh, to um, what was then called, uh, I mean, it was De something like Desert Springs Air Force Base, now Creech Air Force Base, uh, which is the head of all security for the test site. And they got him out of the car with a gun in his ear and they took him in this office and they said, now Bob, when we gave you this clearance, it didn't mean you were to take all your friends up to the test site and show them the flying saucers. So uh, they said, do you want to work here or not? And Bob didn't answer um, because the last two flights he made up to Groom Lake he could remember going up the steps to the 737 at, in the morning, and he could remember coming down the steps that evening, but he couldn't remember anything that he did during that day. Now, we've had that technology for 20, 30 years, <clears throat> but the problem has been that, pe that the, the scientists and engineers have had a nagging feeling. I did something today, but I can't remember what it was. Now, that doesn't occur anymore. <clears throat> they're completely satisfied uh, with not remembering. They don't even remember it. Uh, so when you talk about uh, the astronauts uh, absolutely being convinced, and, and I talked with them. They, one came to interview Bob Lazar, and uh, he absolutely said, yeah, I was on the moon. And I've had other people talk to him personally. He just passed away. I can't remember what his name was name was Brian, somebody uh, said, John Lear says you were never on the moon. He said, well, too bad for John because I was there, I remember it. And uh, that's how good uh, the mind control has, be has come. And they needed that mind control to be sure that the astronauts could never say, no, you know what, we faked it. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. How, how do you know that you're not mind controlled? How would you how would you know that? Could be. You know, Ron Schmidt is an amazing guy, and yes. Yes, we've yes. always thought on the same wavelength. And uh, when the shuttle uh, program was going, our question is, why is it? Why is it going? Why is it that it takes us two and a half days? to get to the International Space Station when it only takes the Russians 37 minutes. Okay, so uh, Jim Oberg, who was the 
NASA frontman who lied for NASA. Um, he came up with all kinds of things. He said, you guys don't know very much about orbital mechanics, do you? Uh, and then we had the same question as, uh, what, always when they'd come back to Earth, it would always take two and a half days, and uh, it only took the Russians uh, 37 minutes to come back. And Jim Oberg responds to that and says, well, you know, they've been working 10 days straight on the unloading in the International Space Station, and um, they're tired and we got to give them crew rest. And uh, so they're getting their crew rest in the shuttle. <laughs> so what happened is Ron somehow came across with uh, the, the uh, manifest for the Vostok. Now, um, when we launched the shuttle, they, one day later they would always launch the Vostok. So our question was why? And he got a hold of a manifest and all it was was food, far more than would ever be needed by the International Space Station. So what we found out, what we finally came up with, was that the shuttle, when it launched, it was going all to the various uh, U.S. Navy space program projects that were in orbit and giving them food, fruit, uh, and supplies and equipment. That's what took them so long to get there. And the way we figured it out is one day Ron showed me uh, a picture of when the uh, shuttle got to uh, the International Space Station they open the hatch and it's only half full. Where did the rest of the stuff go? <laughs> and so then we figured out to the Vostok, what they were doing was after we unloaded anything that was needed at the space station, they loaded it up with all the stuff that they had just brought up. And when the shuttle launched from the International Space Station, they went back down to all the different projects, all the different orbiting uh, factories, giving them food and, uh, and equipment and supplies. And the only reason they stopped that is because uh, now they had developed Quadrant Island as a perfect uh, place to launch from. Nobody could see it. Nobody had any information coming out there. And uh, only by sheer accident that the STS-88 accidentally saw one of the highest classified space planes in existence. And because of carton prioritization, they took a picture of it. And when they got on the ground, they started passing the picture around. But because of compartmentalization, nobody could tell them that it was secret. <laughs> so this picture went around and I've got a bunch of them on the wall here. And what it was was one of these space planes that fits in the nose cone of the rockets that go up from Kwajalein. When it gets up there, it opens, space plane comes out, goes to all the different projects they got, loading, taking equipment, dropping off equipment, and then it can glide back down to Earth on its own and land at Kwajalein or Vandenberg or Edwards Air Force Base or wherever. And the SDS crew accidentally got a picture of that. So when the picture came out, they had a real problem. What do we say this thing is? So first they started calling it a UFO and then they figured that wasn't going to fly. And then they remembered that back in the 50s, um, the U.S., before they started launching satellites, uh, determined that there was a satellite orbiting Earth, and they called it the Black Knight. And it's always been up there, and it's still up there. And so they called <laughs> this space plane the Black Knight. <laughs> and... Uh, it's kind of disappeared since, I mean, the story has disappeared. Nobody talks about it. You, public's uh, retention of information doesn't last more than a day, so. But then, obviously, you know, if I was to sit down next to some scientists, um, various different scientists in various different fields, right, they would say that, um, you know, no such things exist. That it, it, from their knowledge, nothing of this exists. It's all, you know, this is... Well, if I, if I was to sit down with some scientists, right, 
whatever field they might be from, they would say that that there's only you know there's the there's the known planets in in, in our system, yeah. Um, there is there is only the International Space Station. We we only have the technology that we have. We haven't got anything past that right now. Because as as a as a scientist, you know they're working with what they've got. Would that go down? Well, would that go along? Should I say with what you're saying about compartmentalization? Yeah, that's exactly what they're supposed to believe. And uh, even if they suspected there was something else, they're not going to jeopardize their paycheck by saying, "Oh, by the way, I heard this," you know, and he might be true. But then when the, if I was with, like I said before, maybe a, an amateur astronomer or, you know, at some sort of astronomy place, wherever that may be, right, and, and I, you know, they're pointing the, the, the telescope in the night sky and, you know, observing, you know, Mars or, you know, Neptune or Jupiter or whatever it may be, they're not seeing anything more than the planetary systems that are there with, that, with their telescope. So how can they be there if they're not observing them? Because they, for the other... Um, 30 planets, they're hidden with gigantic mirrors which are placed so that when we look up at it, we're just seeing space. We're not seeing the planet. And who's put those mirrors there, would you say? E.T. Multiple races? Yeah, at least multiple races. Going back to my... Um, Going back to 9-11 as well, you know, again, if I was to meet some of the family victims from the Twin Towers, I mean, they're not going to sit comfortably with a directed energy weapon that destroyed the towers. I mean, that's not in their remit. That's not in their understanding. I mean, it's barely in my understanding, do you know what I mean, as I sit here with you. Um, you're never going to convince those people. I mean, if they watch this, they'll say, well, that's just not true. Yeah, and we can accept that because the whole point of the exercise was people didn't think it was true. They don't want people suspecting that there's direct energy weapons. They don't want people suspecting that there's holograms. They spent a lot of money keeping that secret. And they're not going to say anything about it. Now, in the case of Flight 93, <clears throat> um, the crash in Shanksville, Nobody remembers, I remember, that airplane landed in Cleveland Hopkins. And there was video of that, those pastors getting off and going into the NASA hangar there. And then it took off. It obviously didn't go to Shanksville. Uh, but they said it did go to Shanksville and crashed uh, and disappeared in the ground, which is impossible. But the thing that the perps didn't know is the electronic equipment in all uh, aircraft called ACARS, the aircraft communicating and receiving equipment, which is located in the equipment bay under the cockpit, which are, the pilots have no circuit breakers for, and which records vital information, position, altitude, speed, engine temperature, engine EGT, engine RPM, transfers it to the satellite, and then goes to the various uh, the, air, the airplane manufacturers, Boeing, or Rolls-Royce, or Pratt & Whitney, or GE. And through the Freedom of Information Act, we got the ADAR readout after Shanksville, and it was going on for four hours after the plane crashed. But where is that information now? I don't know. But uh, that was enough uh, time to get back to Groom Lake, which is where I think all the flights originated. But you know, people think Groom Lake is a one, one-time deal. There's uh, 20 years ago when I was really into the secrecy stuff. There was 32 AAOs, which are called air access only uh, bases. Uh, so there's plenty more than uh, Groom Lake. What would they have done with the passengers on, on that on that um, plane that crashed at crashed at? Uh, First of all, we don't know there was any passengers. Second of all. Well, people have lost loved ones, or haven't they? I mean, the well, these are crisis actors. Now, if they're not crisis actors, I don't know what they did with their loved ones. They're probably dead. 
and, and that video that you just mentioned there as well, again, that won't be available, but you, but that was out there at some point. Pardon? Oh, yeah. yes, yeah, that would, that would be available. Would that be available? Okay, so, so that's maybe available online somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah, unless they've gotten rid of it, which they would have had to in order to, for the Shanksville crash to fly. Now, what happened was <coughs> they had the um, World Trade Center 1 and 2, the planes hit it. Then they were going to have um, Flight 93, uh, in that Shanksville airplane, crash into Building 7. But something went wrong. It was either projector or something went wrong that they couldn't fake the crash into Building 7. So they had to make a crash site. It was a hurry up deal. They found a, a hole near Shanksville. They put a bunch of parts in there, uh, had a bunch of people standing around in hazmat suits and let the public in six hours later, five o'clock, and said, this is where it crashed. And then they had to figure out, what do we do with Building 7? It's got to be destroyed. What, what do we do? Will the public not ask any questions if we just destroy it? And, well, we don't have any chance. Okay, let's destroy it. And uh, the public's gone for it. I mean, you don't see anybody clamming around what happened to Building 7. They just accepted it. Well, it was strange how they reported it early before it was actually destroyed. Yeah. I mean, that, that the, is out there on, on the BBC. In the UK, clip. they had it 20 minutes before. Yeah, that, that, that is always a bit strange. But then, you know, perhaps, perhaps the, the, you know, in, in, in that day of confusion, major confusion, they'd already thought that Building 7 was, was destroyed. But, you know, um, who, you know, I'm just putting the opposing opinion out there, that's all. In regards to the secret space program, we've had people like Corey Good come forward. We've had people like Emery Smith come forward. Uh, obviously, David Wilcox is covering that quite a bit. Um, do you think w what they're talking about and their ideas and what the secret space program is fits into what you've discussed? I, I have no idea what they think it is. I never listen to their stuff. Maybe if you could brief me, I... Well... You know, Corey Good uh, is, is talking about um, a, a 20 and back program where he spent, well, actually, I, th I believe it's a 60 and back. He spent 20 years, then another 20 years, and then another 20 years. And, uh, you know, he's brought them back in time to when he was at the age when, you know, he would have left to have gone on such a mission. That's bullshit. Those guys, they come up with fantastic ideas. My stuff is based on stuff you can go and check out. Yeah, okay. But some, okay, why would they, why would they tell such a story then? Who? Why would Corey, for example, tell such a story? Money, they need money. Fame, uh, the same thing with um, Wilcox, is that his name? David Wilcox, yeah. 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 I think he's the guy, but, um, but you know, when it's, it's you, what I call UFO disease. Once you experience people, you know, the, the enthralling feeling you get with people listening to everything you have to say, when you run out of stuff, you start making it up because you want that stuff to, to keep going on. Where, if you look at your research, then what what makes your research different? Would you say, is it is your research different because of the people that you've you know spoke to over the many years and you know got their testimonies? What what makes the people's testimonies that you've got any different compared to? I only them? wait until I've got stuff ironclad. For instance, D dot D. I had a friend uh, who knew about it, who drew me a picture of it. Um, the uh, fusion engine, uh, I've been following the progress of that and, uh, and uh, I know from various people, uh, particularly uh, everything that we get, we have to give to the UK. And the UK doesn't have, they have pretty strict 
secrecy, but not as strict as we do. And uh, some of them have told their mothers or friends about the, um, the, the stuff that we have on the hull and the uh, fusion engines. Not in so many words, but enough that we could know, yeah, John's right. Um, the uh, uh, Miles Johnson, uh, many years ago, sent me that picture up there. Uh, let me see if I can point it out here. This one. He was on a tower right as the sun set. And he looked up, and here's that vehicle. And it took seven seconds to get from overhead to the horizon. Having been familiar with airplanes all his life, he knew that it was at least as 10 times the size of a 747. And uh, it was headed towards Macrahanish, where we know there's a secret base. Uh, but it took me, you know, 10, 15 years to figure out what it was doing, why it was there. And it's the craft that's bringing down the steel plates for the submarines and the aircraft carriers. It had to be something that big. But then I could look at a story that Kerry Cassidy covers, like Mark Richards. Now, Mark Richards is a uh, guy that's in jail. and um, I've never believed Mark Richards' story so convinced me. Well, I, I've, just spent, I've just spent two weeks in uh, San Rafael um, collecting the information on him. And the, um, I'm making a little documentary on it to show that Mark Richards um, is not a secret space program whistleblower. He was part of a murder that took place on July 6, 1982. And he's saying that he was framed for that murder by the deep state. But when I spoke to the lead detectives that arrested him in 1982 and charged him, uh, that's not true. And then when I spoke to his... Excellent, Kevin. Excellent work. <laughs> and when I, when I spoke to his crime partner that had committed the murder for him, he told me that Mark Richards was stood one foot away from him as he committed the murder. So he was on the planet when the murder took place. And I got all the court transcripts as well of what was said in the courts. You are amazing. Thank you very much for your work. And it's, it's a full story. And I'm not, I'm not against Kerry. I mean, if she wants to cover that story, she believes it's true, that's fa fair enough, right? But you have to do your research. And I, I spent two weeks in San Rafael doing the research, knocking on doors and even interviewing Mark Richards' ex-wife, uh, crossing Hoover's partner. And I just got in contact with the murder victim's sister, Richard Baldwin's sister called Susan Baldwin. And she was there at the time of the court hearings for both Crossing and Mark Richards, and none of it's true. Mark Richards was a fantasy writer back in the day, and he is now. Thank you for your work, Kevin. You're really an amazing guy. Well, you know, why did I do it? Well, it was, it was just to try to give us some context in the stories that are out there. Now, there's, Mark Richards is one story, there are so many other stories. How many, how much disinformation do you think there is in the field? Um, I've always said, you mean of all the information could be? Um, we had, Ron and I had a friend come to visit us before he was going into uh, deep intelligence work. And he said, I won't be able to contact you, so this is your last chance, and I said, I think that of all the information there is, the public knows 1%. I think I know 1.5%. He said, that's about right. So let me ask you this. Would you be willing to say that your information, that some of it could be, you're doing your best to try to get it right, but there could be a, a, a inaccuracy in some of your research as well? Absolutely, positively, yes. Well, I really appreciate you saying that as well. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you. How could you say anything else? I don't think anyone's ever asked you that. <laughs> <laughs>
But but when Kerry comes to see you this week, I'm I'm not against Kerry. This is not, you know. Yes, we've got a disagreement right now, but you know she's free to do what she wants, and we're all at different stages. All and what if I was wrong about Mark Richards? What if I was? But I've just gone with the evidence. That's yeah, it. Yeah. That's it. So, would you say that you're a whistleblower? Um, yes. The last uh, 69 months, I've been posting secrets on Facebook that I know. But the clearance that I had expired many years ago. I had a Q clearance. I can give you the number. You can check it out. Um, but, you know, I didn't learn anything when I had that clearance, what I'm talking about now. Now it's just stuff that I know from uh, friends that work there. Now, I've lived in Las Vegas since 1973, and I've met a lot of people. And, you know, the guy that flew with me over in Laos ended up chief pilot for special projects. Uh, the girl that was uh, flew with me at Nevada Airlines ended up chief flight attendant for special projects. Now, I never got any information from either one of them, but that's how deep my contacts go. Yeah, absolutely. And did you work for the CIA ever? Yeah. Yeah. And have you talked about that as much as you can? Is there things that you've left out? No. No. I'm told that uh, I worked for the CIA for two years before I knew I was working for them. It was just some guy said, uh, do you know who we work for? And I said, World Aviation. And he said, but I mean, really work for it. And then he started to explain it. And, uh, uh, you know, I never had a a file, I forget what they call the file of the CIA. I just did, all, you know, contract work. You know, get Lear, he'll be good for this, you know. And that's how I ended up in Mogadishu in 1977. And uh, I got a call. I was in Las Vegas and uh, I think I was, I was flying for Nevada Airlines then. And uh, the guy says, uh, Thick German accent. Uh, I understand you're rated in the 707. I need a pilot uh, to do some work over here and uh, in Europe. Pay a hundred bucks an hour. Would you be able to do it? Yeah. So he said, "We'll go to Frankfurt and uh, check into the international hotel there at the airport." and uh, I'll contact you there. So we talked a little bit about who's, how am I going to get paid for the ticket. He said, I'll give you cash. So uh, got on the airplane, went to Frankfurt, checked in, and uh, there was a note on my phone, uh, we'll talk to you later. And. Uh, That evening, I got a message, or I think I talked, forget how I got the message. Go to Lufthansa counter at 10 o'clock. There'll be a ticket there waiting for you uh, to go to Budapest. And uh, I'll call you, or I'll meet you in Budapest. So I'm getting my ticket, and here come eight other guys that I knew from uh, the flying I'd done in Cairo. And I said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, well, you don't think you're getting in on a deal like this without us, do you? <laughs> so we all go to Budapest, and there's obviously a CIA guy or somebody standing at customs that got us through. Go to the uh, Hilton, I think it was, and uh, check in, get a call, at eight o'clock, go to room such and such. So we all go up there and uh, there's a bunch of chairs around and there's nine of us. And uh, let's see, three times, yeah, nine. And uh, this guy comes in 
He introduces himself as Hank Wharton and uh, starts giving us a travelogue on Budapest. He said, actually, Budapest is two towns, Buda on the north of the Danube and Pest on the south, connected with the chain bridge. It's October and it's starting to cool off now, but not too cold at night. And as he's telling us this, he's got a piece of paper like this, and he hands it to one guy and says, you know, and so he reads it and just carrying on the catalog. And as soon as that guy finishes it, he takes it and points it to another guy. We all read it. And then when we're done, uh, as a matter of fact, I have that piece of paper. And uh, he said, we're going to go for a walk on the chain bridge and uh, we're going to go get dinner. So we go out and, and uh, the chain bridge was just across from the hotel. And we get out in the middle and there's nobody there except us. And he says, okay, here's what we're doing. Uh, we're taking supplies to Mogadishu. Um, you'll refuel in Jeddah. Don't talk to anybody, don't say anything. When they unload all the stuff in, in uh, Mogadishu, just turn around and come back. And uh, so went to uh, have dinner and got up at uh, three o'clock in the morning, had breakfast and uh, go out to the airport. And at zero, zero, I mean, it is foggy beyond all belief. And the airplanes are all there powered up and there's military guys all standing around with rifles at port arms. And uh, we get in I take the first airplane because I didn't want to be slowed down by any of the other guys and and uh, start up and go out to the runway. And we're not limited by FAA because we're not flying U.S. registered airplanes. And uh, so the tower is not there to limit your takeoff. They can't say you can't take off. All they can do is clear you for takeoff, which they did. and. Uh, we took off and everybody followed me. We go to um, uh, Jeddah, refuel there. And then uh, from Jeddah, we fly down the Red Sea. We were briefed, it'll, you'll have no radio communications. You're going radio silence the whole way. They didn't explain exactly why, but the reason was is because uh, the MiG stationed at Aden, uh, which is uh, East Block Control, Communist Control, they knew this was going on and they didn't like it and they were going to shoot down the airplane. But what had happened is uh, a couple of weeks before they asked us to come over there, uh, they had forced an airplane down. Now our planes were painted very similar to Somali airplanes, and they forced a Somali airplane, which they thought was us, down, and it was passengers, and they were very embarrassed. So uh, they were going to be sure next time that they didn't make a mistake. And uh, so we got down to Mogadishu, and as fate would have it, there's a thunderstorm right over the field, and uh, I had minimum fuel, and um, I made an approach, which was the uh, the main approach of my life, it was what they call a 9270 uh, because there was no instrument approach or anything and it was a hundred and quarter uh, in heavy rain. Made it, landed, uh, everybody else got in, the thunderstorm blew out and they all land in perfect conditions. We, uh, they unload the airplane, we go to a hotel and get a couple hours sleep, come back, fly back through Jeddah, come back home. And uh, this went on for a couple of weeks and there was some problem that we had to stop and, and, and that was that. But uh, that was obviously a CIA operation. What were you moving around, do you think? What were you trying Arms. to Arms. And what it was, was Russia had traditionally supported Somalia and they had 
built a deep water port on the north side of Somalia at the Gulf of Aden. And uh, it was the only deep water port on the Red Sea. Now, at this time in 1977, the name of the game was real estate on the, on the Red Sea. The reason was because if the Straits of Hormuz were ever closed, that would block all oil coming out of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and they had to have another way to get it out. So they built these huge pipelines that went all the way across Saudi Arabia to Yanbu on the, south, on the uh, Red Sea, and then the freighters would load up there and either go out the Suez Canal or the Gulf of Aden. But wherever it was going to go, we, U.S., needed real estate uh, to park their ships and get refueled. And uh, so <clears throat> Russia made the gigantic mistake of supporting um, the rebels uh, on, at Ethiopia, uh, just to the north, which is their lifelong Somali enemies. And the Somalis kicked the Russians out based on that. We went in and say, hey, we want to be your friends. What can we do? We need ammunition for our guns. Well, you know, the problem is East Block ammunition is one millimeter less than West Block. So we couldn't give them our stuff. We had to go and buy stuff. Uh, and, you know, in East Block it was pretty easy in those days if you knew who to go to. And that's why it ended up in Budapest, is because all that ammunition was East Block, which we bought and took down to Arms Somalia. Wow. God, oh, my God, man. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you as well was about Vietnam, because you know, you speak to most Vietnam war heroes or soldiers that fought in Vietnam, they're, you know, they'll say the war was all about communists, right? Um, but you know, obviously there, there's stories that, that, that have been covered now to say that the Vietnam War was, was for something else, was, was for some ET agenda. It was what? For some sort of ET agenda. Um, we went there to fight off the ETs. Now, obviously to me, having known some Vietnam people, they would, you know, just kind of say that that's just not true. They were there, you know, killing people savagely, right? What's your take on Vietnam? Well, um, it was a put off job. As you know, the Gulf of Tonkin is, and it was bullshit. It never happened. Uh, they wanted a war. <clears throat> and at that time, the Nazis had taken over Bell Helicopter and they wanted to sell helicopters. And amazed sold a shit pot load based on this war. So, you know, I believe that, uh, and it's hard to believe this story, but we know that the Holocaust was bullshit. There weren't six million Joes killed. There may have been 800,000, but they were not gassed. They died along with Poles and all other factions that died during World War II. The Jews were not, but the reason they floated this 6, heli or 6 million Holocaust was because the Jews were going to ally with the Germans to take over the world. And as hard as this is to believe, uh, you know that Hitler uh, survived World War II, went to Antarctica, then went to South America, and he died in a, a hospital in the uh, middle of the United States in 1968. And I think he pretty much ran things up until then. And uh, there's so much Israeli influence in the U.S. government, they have literally taken us over. <clears throat> and in 1925, a guy was born to a wealthy Jewish family in the Philippines. His name was Ben Rich. And uh, when he got of uh, college age, uh, they sent him to California and he went to UCLA and uh, University of California at Berkeley for his engineering degree. In 1953, they got him a job at Lockheed. Uh, in 1954, 
he was doing such a superior job, they wanted to funnel him into the Skunk Works. But the problem was, he was born in the Philippines, and you cannot, under any circumstances, get a security, high-level security clearance if you haven't been born in the United States. So they faked his background. And the reason they were able to do this is there's so many dual American Israelis working in high-level places, it was no problem. His new identity was Ben Dover, B-E-N and then Dover. And what that name was was an inside joke against American intelligence, giving him a security clearance when he shouldn't have had it. He got the security clearance, continued to work for the Skunk Works, was very helpful in the Blackbird program. And when Kelly Johnson um, retired in 1975, he took over the Skunk Works. And he ran the Skunk Works until, I think, uh, 1990 when he retired and he died in 1995. Um, when he took over the Skunk Works, uh, he supervised the construction of an airplane called the F-19 and I have pictures of a model of it. And all of us that were interested in black airplanes originally thought the airplane was called the F-19. And a couple of years later, the Air Force says, no, 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 that's the F-117A. We call it the F-117A. And everybody forgot about the F-19, but there was an F-19. They made 64 of them. I have a friend in town that worked on them, told me the whole story. And what they did is it was a bat-winged airplane, much more advanced than the 117A. And guess where they went? Israel. <laughs> so it turns out that Ben Rich was the highest ranking Mossad spy west of the Mississippi, running the Skunk Works. He had access to everything. The reason I'm telling you this story is to show you how the Israelis have infiltrated our country and more or less taken over. Obviously with Vietnam, there's those, you've talked about this before, where, or you've agreed with it before, maybe should I say, where the whole Vietnam War was not for the reason it was for, it was for a different reason. Yeah, that's possible that uh, there definitely was uh, a, um, uh, a, a Mothman type, and when I say Mothman type, it stood about uh, seven feet tall, had wings, but it didn't use the wings to fly. It could, without the wings flapping, it could go up and around. And uh, Lou Baldwin is the one that uh, told us about that and wrote about it and said that he was stationed in Okinawa with a uh, secret unit that was only sent over there when they would find one of these uh, enclaves or, or uh, uh, aliens at some point and they would go over there and try and find them and catch them. But, and, but the actual main Vietnam War did happen because if you speak to Vietnam vets, they were there. Yeah, absolutely. They and were killing on a mass scale. And what? On a mass scale, they were, they were slaughtering people. Yeah, yeah. It was faked uh, by the Gulf of Tonkin incident to sell helicopters, and yes, the reason was, the, the stated reason was, we didn't want Vietnam to fall, which would be the Donald Don theory, that as soon as they fall, then Bangkok or Thailand would fall, da 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 da. So, so you don't, yeah, yeah, you don't go against that, you know, no. Vietnam soldiers fought there oh, in no. hand combat, right? 58,000 Americans died there. Exactly, we can't deny that. But no. what you're saying was there was also some other activity that went on there as well right, right. that was kept hushed up, right? right? Yeah, yeah, okay. What would you say your take is on Antarctica right now? When p There's so many researchers saying that it's all in Antarctica. Now, if I ever went to Antarctica, which you can't just easily go there, right, because it's so inaccessible. Would I really find anything there? You wouldn't be allowed to get there, but there is a huge, huge civilization there. Now, why Buzz Aldrin called it evil, I don't know. 
but there is a huge civilization there. And uh, Linda Howe uh, interviewed the C-130 pilot that accidentally saw it. Uh, but just before we started talking about this, there was something else I wanted to continue on. What we were talking about just prior. To oh, you were just argument. you were just saying about uh, the flying saucers and aliens uh, that you don't see that you don't see them anymore. They were, they've taken oh, them oh, away. Oh, yeah. Um, no, not they, they were all moved to uh, Woomera. Now the reason they moved to Woomera is they're sick of people going up to uh, Highway 375 and watching them fly there, and they had nowhere else to go. They couldn't be found out by people here, so they just moved it all to South Central Australia. And uh, Woomera is the former uh, nuclear test area, and there's plenty of underground facilities there they can hide this stuff in. Fortunately, <laughs> I have some friends down there that to send me uh, drawings and information about what's going on. And uh, he told me one night about uh, nine or ten of them flying along and uh, the first set were triangles with a light on each side and uh, then there was another set that came along that was a elongated triangle and he said John it sounded like a prop airplane and I said that's probably a fake because they don't want people to look up and if they hear a prop they're not going to look up so they've got a way to make it sound like it's a prop. What do you think is about something like the the Phoenix Lights? The what? The Phoenix Lights. Phoenix Lights with us, uh, you know, they had the missing man formation, so it was obviously uh, specific for some kind of accident or something. Uh, but that was us. That wasn't easy. No. Well, okay, because we've not got very long left, but. Um, you were saying about Antarctica, what you found. Oh, Antarctica, yeah. Uh, it's huge, and I haven't got any inside information, the best stories that Linda Howe has, and uh, I've had people, one or two people go down there, transferred down there, and I said, whatever you do, don't try to give me information, because you will get caught. <laughs> Okay. So, the only thing I want to know is Buzz Aldrin went down there and said he saw evil. Now, I don't know what that means. Did he, did he think he means by uh, it nearly killed him, for example? It nearly, it nearly finished him off? Just the, 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 it's so, it's not meant for humans, Antarctic. So do, do you think that's what he, what he meant? Could be. We were not supposed to be there. Now, how Admiral Byrd got away with it, uh, I don't know. Now, getting back to um, Bob Lazar, um, after all these years now, there's a new documentary coming out on the Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes out next year. Do you think there'll be any new information that comes out in that, doc in that kind of documentary or movie? I, there can't be, because there, as far as I know, uh, Bob hasn't been back to work. now. I have a friend who swore to me that he saw Bob up there a couple of years ago. And I've asked to Bob, he said, no way. And uh, I say, well, couldn't they have give you mind control? He said, but everybody here has seen me here during the weekends. I'm here all the time. So I don't know what the real story is, but <clears throat> The bottom line on the Bob story, Bob Lazar's story, was Mike McConnell, who was MJ1, uh, wanted to get the, some of the information out on the saucers and ET, and they needed somebody who was uh, had enough degrees and was smart enough they could legitimately hire at the same time. They needed to be able to discredit that guy instantly if things went south. So since Bob ran a can house up in Reno and did a, a, lot of, a couple other things, 
they were able to, you know, if they needed to, discredit him instantly. They knew that Bob would instantly tell me the information, and they knew that I would, you know, pass it on to the public, and that's what they wanted. They wanted to see the public reaction to stuff, but they also wanted to be able to deny it. So that's why they hired Bob. That's why he went up there and it worked out just like they said. He came over and told me, uh, and if it wasn't that scenario, why did they let him continue to talk to me every fucking time he went over there? Well, you know, obviously Stanton Freeman, if you speak to Stanton Freeman about Bob Lazar, Stanton you know, says that, you know, there are no, there's no evidence of his qualifications. You know, his story doesn't, it doesn't check out completely. Yeah, I told Stan if he could ever prove that Bob didn't go up there, I'd kiss his ass in the center of Flamingo and Maryland Parkway at high noon, you know. Um, but, you know, both Stan Friedman and this other move on guy, I'm trying to think of his name, they just couldn't stand for that story to be true. Absolutely could not stand it. So, <clears throat> you know, they, and to this day, this one guy, move on guy, I still don't believe he, he believes it because when George Knapp gave his lecture two years ago down in Phoenix uh, and said, I believe it's true, and here's why I believe it's true. In the auditorium, there was a group, you know, at the far back, all by themselves. You know, he said, I guess you're the guys that still don't believe the story. And they said, yeah, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and obviously, there's the question as well of, like, you know, in Lazar's story, you know, did he ever see any aliens at S4? Yeah, and the way it happened is in uh, February of 89, you know, he would come up here after being a desk floor, and he'd tell me what was going on. And he comes up one night, sits down in the chair there, and he's fidgety, and he keeps giving me the high sign. Now, we never talked in here anymore because we knew it was bugged, and they heard everything, so... He gave me the high sign, let's go out. So it was in the evening. It was bitter cold, and I just had short sleeves on. We walk out by the pool, and beyond the pool, there's a big wooden gate, and beyond that is the stables and the tennis court. We go there. Marilee is usually suspicious of us together at any time. Where are you guys going? <laughs> so we go out there, <clears throat> close the gate, and... I said, what, what, what? And he said, John, you'll never know what it's like to see your first alien. I said, you saw one? Yeah. It couldn't have been a, couldn't have been a doll, it couldn't have been, no. I thought, how did it happen? He said, I was being led down this hallway, security on both sides of me. We went by this door that had a, a frame with the, wires going through it, and through this door, <clears throat> I could see two lab cabinet, uh, technicians with their coats on looking towards me with a gray standing there with his back to me conversing with them. And uh, we talked maybe five or ten minutes about it, and, you know, he convinced me that he didn't see one. Ever since then, He's denied it. He said, Lear made that up. Uh, it was it was probably a monkey or something. You know, he's come up with a story, mainly because he doesn't want to be associated with having seen an alien. It's just not part of his deal. But he did, for sure. Do you two talk much? Do you talk with him much still? All the time. He saved my life uh, nine months ago. Uh, for the last four years, I had been taking methadone and oxycodone uh, for my back problems and uh, other physical problems I got. And last May, the DEA put out an edict that no longer could our primary doctors issue pain medication, that we would have to go 
to a pain management specialist, which I did on May 31st, uh, Dr. Chibi's, <coughs> and uh, Marilee took me there. Uh, I gave him a urine sample. He asked me a couple of questions, gave me a prescription for the oxycodone and the methadone. We left. Two days later, he calls Marilee and says, we can't treat your husband anymore. He's tested positive for methamphetamine. Well, the chances of me using methamphetamine are a billion, a trillion to one. First of all, I have not left this den in eight years except to go to the doctor. Second of all, I was taking methadone and oxycodone. Codone. Why would I take methadone? Third of all, how would I get methadone? Fourth of all, how would I take it? I don't even know how you take methadone. So anyway, somebody had spiked it. And <clears throat> to make a long story short, when I went to George Knapp, my friend of 40 years, and told him this story, he said, John, this is going on nationwide. He said, I'm doing a 10-part series on opioids. He said, the reason they're doing this is they only do it with patients, uh, you know, Southwest Medical, uh, you cost them probably over half a million dollars with all the uh, problems you've had. They can't afford it. So they want to get rid of you, and the only way they can do that <clears throat> is to spike your sample so that you can't get any medicine, hopefully so that when you go through um, detox, involuntary detox, you'll kill yourself. And that's what's happening nationwide. And he, you know, did a story on that. So fortunately, <clears throat> uh, two weeks into involuntary detox, I called Bob and I said, I'm not going to make it, Bob. I just don't feel like going on. He said, look, they've come up with this stuff called Kratom. He said, Goofon, Gene Hunt, has some. Why don't you get him more? He said, let me call him. So Gene Hunt came over with a bottle of Kratom. I tried it. And it changed my life, you know. It just, it helped me endure the detox, which, you know, I haven't taken any opioids for a year now. <clears throat> and uh, I take it right here. I take two teaspoons full every four hours. And uh, it helps me continue on. And uh, <clears throat> so... So he saved your life in a sense. Yeah, he yeah. saved my life. And then about two months after that, I was so weak that I couldn't pick up my TV changer. I called him again. He said, go down to the grocery store and get this stuff called 5-HTP. It's, he says it's for people that have are detoxing for at least 60 days. Don't take it before 60 days, but take it after it will help you get your energy back. And I'll be damned, four weeks later, it started to work, and I've taken it ever since. But those are two times you saved my life, and, you know, we talk every once in a while. But uh, Bob's story will carry on with in the new documentary to a new audience. Yeah. And I just hope it's as truthful as it can be to, you know, what you went through with him and you know the journey that he's been on as well yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think when you look back after all these years at the current state of ufology in a sense H how do you feel that it's it is right now it's kind of a joke you know it's they're not getting anywhere. they won't get anywhere they talk about disclosure and I will tell you one thing it will never happen ever 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 the deal is with E.T. that they will not disclose anything that's going on. That's why I say if disclosure comes out, it'll be a fake story. It won't be the real story. Do you believe something like Roswell? Do you think that something like Roswell did happen? Absolutely, positively. Have you read all of Lou Baldwin's books? No. You have to buy at least five or six of them and read them because it's important that you know that information that Lou is putting out. Well, I've read Donald Schmidt's books. Donald right. Schmidt? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've read his books. On, Which, on is that the tall 
Gray's ones? Uh, no, no, on, on Roswell, Donald Schmidt's book. Oh, on, yeah, okay. The day after Roswell, yeah. yeah. Uh, not the day after, sorry. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, I mean, the, well, Donald Schmidt's books on, on, on Roswell, yeah. Uh, Read Lou Baldwin's book on okay. uh, Roswell because Carrie emailed me yesterday and she wanted to know if I had Majestic and I was the first guy to get Majestic. I had two copies up there uh, and that was pretty neat. But uh, Lou Baldwin has the best. And you'd say that Majestic was a real thing? Majestic 12 was a real Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. And, you know, when I first, Bill, when uh, Bill Moore first came out with it and everybody was saying, oh, it's bullshit, I knew there was one guy that I could rely on whether Majestic was true or not, and that was General Jimmy Doolittle. Now, that... That's a picture of him taking off from the, on the aircraft carrier to bomb Japan. And that letter right there, two pages, is he was the only one to take the time to write me a letter saying we all make mistakes. The important thing is you profit from your mistakes. And uh, we've always been friends since then. I didn't see him that often. Uh, and when his wife died, he moved to Carmel and uh, lived by himself and he would talk to my mom about every month. Yeah, they were very close. So I knew that the only way for Jimmy to do a little was with my mom. Now, have you heard me tell this story before? I think on a previous interview, yeah. That he, okay. he knew he liked your mom, is that right? What? Did he like your mom? Yeah. Yeah, he did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I told her what I needed, and uh, it took her about four or five months to work up her courage. And so next time Jimmy called her, she said, you know, Jimmy, John's getting involved in some stuff and I don't know really whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I would like to know if Majestic was real. And he said, yes, Maria, it was, but I can't talk anything about it. And that was what set me off forever on UFOs because I knew that Jimmy was telling the truth. That meant that Majestic was real. That meant that the briefing was probably real. And uh, that's what set me off. And how, was, how old was you at that time? Do you that think? was 1986, so <clears throat> that was, I would have been uh, uh, 44. 44, 40, yeah. 43. 43 when you got set. Yeah. And uh, it was that word from Jimmy Doolittle that... Uh, that I was convinced now that most of the stuff we heard was true. So people watching this then, how do they use discernment to see what's, what's true and what's not true? H how does someone watching this, you know, in the whole ufology community, in, in your work as well, how do they discern? I don't know. You want to know how I discern? Well, how do you discern then? Well, give me a for instance. Okay. Um, oh. Um, Phil Schneider. Now, Phil Schneider was up here two or three times, showed me his wounds, told me the story. Uh, it had to be bullshit because he was never in the firefight because there was no firefight. Uh, it was an accident. Bob read about it at S4. And what happened is an EVE was giving a lecture to 44 scientists. And it was a small auditorium, and a Delta Force guy walked in there by accident. Everybody had been briefed, you don't wear sidearms or carry ammunition. Is this Dulcie, the story of Dulcie? Yeah. yeah, in Dulcie. In Dulcie. Uh, you don't wear sidearms or carry ammunition anywhere near your beat because you will be killed instantly. So when the Delta Force guy walked in there, the EV kill them instantly. When they saw it on the monitor from the Delta headquarters, they all went down there in mass. And there was, let's see, 22, I think 21 of them. And they went down there to take revenge. And the ET not only killed 20 with them, but all the 44 scientists. And that was known as the, I think, the, uh, I don't know what it was known as, but people have called it the Dulcie Wars. There was no war, it was an accident. And uh, Bob Red uh, 
a summary of what I just told you at S4 in one of the briefings. The only difference, uh, the one he read, it didn't say Dulcie. As a matter of fact, it didn't say anything. But the reason I don't think that it, they left Dulcie out, I don't think his clearance was to the level that uh, he was allowed to know about Dulcie. But I have two friends there that work there, and so, you know, I know it's true. Yeah, I mean, uh, when, we, when you look at the Mark Richards story, for example, he talks about him and his dad went down there uh, to, to um, you know, have a firefight at Dulcie. But I don't, I don't believe that. No. No. Impossible. <clears throat> yeah. And the way I learned about Dulcie was in 1987, uh, I was invited to Crestone, Colorado, uh, by a group of uh, seven ufologists uh, who were meeting to trade information. And there was Tom Adams, Linda Molenhau, and uh, uh, what was his name? Oh, there were four other guys. <clears throat> and uh, we traded information for a couple of nights. And uh, then Linda Howe and I drove down to Albuquerque. I had my truck, she didn't have any transportation. But during this meeting, Tom Adams came up to me and says, John, I got this letter uh, from somebody in Henderson. Uh, I can't get back there to Las Vegas. Would you take care of it? And I said, sure. So he handed me the letter from Cherry Hinkle. And uh, it was that she had a friend that worked at Dulcie. And uh, there were tile hallways that went on forever, <clears throat> and da 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 da. So when I got back here, I contacted her, and then developed a relationship with her, um, where she eventually showed me the pen and ink drawings, the uh, uh, the uh, pencil drawings, which I still have right here. She drew me of the pictures of Dulcie that the the uh, guard had, had uh, taken. And I made uh, belt tip pen copies of those pencil drawings, distributed them as the Dulcie papers. Those are the famous Dulcie papers. I wish I had put my name on it, but I didn't. <laughs> and, and you've got so much um, files here. There's so much information tucked away in this room. Um, when you're not with us one day, um, which will be a sad day, but when you're not, um, what, what do you want done with all, all of your files, all of your info? Where would you... All my UFO stuff is on the um, hard drive back of this computer, and I've told them when I kick off, take that to a different place. Um, what nobody knows is I gave most of my files I sent back to North Carolina for my daughter Jax to take care of. And uh, so when I'm not here, she'll know what to do with them. Right. So those things are protected. Good. What, what, what do you want people to look back on your legacy as? What do you want your legacy in this field to be, would you say? Uh, to live your life with integrity, without envy, hate, or greed. Well, that's four things, and there's they're, 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 they're some great things there. Um, I know we're out of time right now, OK? Um, because we've, we, this has been nearly two hours now and I know we've missed out a lot of information but there's loads of previous interviews that you've done on other shows that if people want to uh, continue to dig into the archives it's all there. Um, well I just want to thank you for allowing you, me to interview you, you can me permission to do that and um, just thank you for the information that you shared as well. Okay, and I want to thank you for the information on Mark Richards. That is really very, very good. Thank you, thank you.